Good afternoon and welcome back to the Pennsylvania Literary Festival held here at the Uniontown Mall in Fayette County. This is the second day of all of our festivities. We have one more to go tomorrow and there's plenty left to do yet tonight. I'm moderating another one of our author panels and this one is mainstream fiction with a little something extra. And that something extra is going to be a little different depending on each of our authors up here. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And we'll start on the end with Jason Jack Miller. Thank you. Um, my name is Jason Jack Miller. I was born and raised in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Um, my stories were initially inspired um, by my experiences as a raft guide on the Yawk River. And uh, I was able to turn those into a, a series that I'm very happy with, uh, Murder Ballads and Whiskey, which is based on the magical aspects of the Appalachians. North of the Mason Dixon, we say Appalachian, so some people might be confused by that. Thank you. And yes, we are related. <laughs> and next we have Melissa Carey. All right. Uh, like I said, I'm Melissa Carey. I'm the author of Macy's Guide to the Odd, Strange, Bizarre, Unique, Unexplained, and Twisted. I'm originally from Dunbar, Pennsylvania, and I'm now in Cranberry. And yeah, it's a little something extra in the book. <laughs> and Randall Silvis. Multi-genre author. Um, I not only write fiction, but creative nonfiction, and uh, had uh, plays produced off off Broadway. And I'm a produced screenwriter, so I guess it figures that because I like to write in just about every genre, I also write in several genres of fiction. Um, I started out as a literary novelist, so all of my books have deep characterization, a lot of attention to language but uh, I also tried to make them more accessible by having a dynamic plot. So I write in uh, soft science fiction sometimes. Sometimes it's a crime or thriller plot. Sometimes there's magic realism, uh, sometimes slipstream, and did I say paranormal? <laughs> <laughs> or just about everything else. <laughs> in case Reese right. Okay, wonderful. Um, when you talk about mainstream fiction, essentially the definition for that is the type of fiction that adults are reading that is open to a broad market. That means that you have an audience that um, can range from someone who normally reads genre fiction, which genre, of course, is just romance or just mystery, that type of thing. But uh, mainstream fiction sometimes has a little bit of that genre mixed in and it has an appeal, though, to people who maybe aren't as interested in a, a, a science fiction novel just for the sake of science fiction. Um, I'm actually going to start with Melissa, because Melissa is our only YA, young adult author, that's on the panel. And I wanted you to speak a little bit to what makes YA young adult and the fact that the audience isn't just young adults for for YA. This is the, the biggest thing, and I don't know why I was surprised. I know that this happens, but um, there, there's quite an adult following uh, for much of the young adult genre out there. Um, with mine, what we found is that because the writing deals with a little bit of the grief and loss elements in life, and the twist into the psychic and dreamer come true abilities and things, that it appeals to that market and to those people like you and I who've picked up the phone right before it rings or answer the text message right before it comes through or, you know, those things that happen. And so there is this, this crossover market for the adults that has the appeal for young adult. Um, but you're still, it's really the style of writing that makes it young adult and how you're approaching it and probably the depth level that you're getting into. And maybe that appeals to adults as well, because we don't always want to go home and read the heavy thing. So if you can have a heavy topic that doesn't have the extreme depth and emotional pull. And maybe that's what you need that day. So that's my theory. Ah, very good. And also, you, um, yours have a, a bit of a supernatural element to mm -hmm. it as well. And that's what Randall was talking about earlier with the paranormal in the supernatural, and I know that Jason also, um, all three of you have 
a bit of that. And Cerise is going to be our, our science fiction girl that we're going to talk to about in the end. But she writes other than science fiction as well. Um, Randall and Jason, you both have written magical realism stories. And Jason, would you tell us a little bit what magical realism by I definition is? I was hoping is? that you would have given Randall that question. <laughs> 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 I know, right? Because uh, I've written a paper on it, and that I don't think it scratched the surface. Um, magical realism is not fantasy because um, I think the details, the concrete details, ac um, anchor it firmly in our world. Um, and the best example that I, I think of, uh, and I use this often, is in 100 Years of Solitude, uh, Mark has used a trail of blood moving through the city, up over a curb, around the carpet in the parlor, um, to illustrate the, sp the spread of bad news. And in that particular instance, the blood wasn't a, a metaphor. And there's the realism, realism aspect. It was actual, literal blood. And Marquez is, of course, the master. And when he talks about you know, a man with angel's wings, they're not metaphoric angel wings. They're not tattooed angel wings. It's a man who has fallen to earth, and he has angel's wings. And uh, the people don't react to it as if it's you know, fantastic. It's Part of the uh, part of the realism, part of their world. Um, Big Fish is a movie that really embodies that. So, I think that's probably the example that maybe most people will be familiar with. Right, um, Randall. When you mix in a little of these other genre elements with something that is either a literary narrative or just a, a mainstream contemporary narrative, how do you do it in such a way that you know that you're going to hit the audience that you want to hit? Or do well, you even think about audience when you're writing it? Yeah, you pose the question assuming that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, I get an idea for a story, and I write that story. And sometimes it's magic realism, sometimes it's crime. Um, I'm drawn to characters mainly. And for Mundo Muerto, I had Lucia Luna, uh, this dark-haired beauty, in my head for 10 years. And I saw the opening scene of her sitting on a boulder singing as this fisherman come in for the, their day's work. It took me 10 years to fill out the rest of the story. And I was, had a phone conversation with my agent one time, and, and he asked me what my next novel was going to be, and I said, I don't know, what's hot now? And uh, <laughs> that was the time that Caleb Carr, Carr was writing the agent, had written The Agentist, and was very popular. And he said, you know, with your literary background, you should do a mystery featuring a literary figure. And I said, Edgar Allan Poe, that's a psyche I'd love to plumb. Um, and that's how that came about. So I, I really don't, I'm not the kind of writer who's analytical about what he does. Um, I just sit down in the morning, I make a cup of tea, sit down in the morning and write. And uh, the story presents itself to me somewhere along the way. And I wait until I'm ready, I feel I'm ready to start telling it, and I write it. So it comes to me intact in, in such a way I never try to embed a, a particular kind of element in the story. It has to come, it has to grow organically. Cerise, how about you? When you come up with an idea, does it brew for a while, or what is your process? Of course, and um, I just sit down and I try to write out a plot and um, it all just sort of meshes together. Um, like my latest plot, it's taken a year for me to figure out, because I was going to write two books and I said, well, why not mesh them together? Huh. And um, one morning I woke up, I said, yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm working on now. So yeah, it's a, it's a long process for me. That happens to me too. I always say, people ask, where do you get your ideas? And I always say from dreams, both the nighttime dreams and the daydreams that you have because that just it mauls over and over in your head. And Melissa, you're shaking your head about that. Have you had those experiences? I've had the character wake me up at 2 o'clock in the morning going, are you going to write my story? Ah. And are you going to finish it? But yeah, those pieces of the dreams, uh, you know, and, and like you said, day, daytime dreams. I know I'm in a good writing spot, in a good writing mode, if I can't see the walls in the room and I'm not feeling the the couch or the computer desk, you know, the chair behind me. If I'm I'm in that kind of dream state feeling 
and just kind of experiencing the, the book as a participant, maybe, less than a writer. So I know I've hit that groove when, when I get there, and that to me is that kind of daydreaming feel. I, I have that too. And actually, Psychology Today just did an article, I think it was last month, that said that writers are the biggest daydreamers and how it's actually very healthy. They have healthy psyches because of that. I said, I'll take that. You know, maybe it's heading towards delusion, but <laughs> you don't know. It's a good uh, excuse. Exactly, exactly. Um, I was going to ask Jason this question, and then uh, kind of all of you might think about this too. When a publisher defines what category your work is going to go into, um, how, do you, how do you feel about that? And what happens if maybe you agree or disagree? How, how do you come about that? what type of mentor to assign you. And I started off as uh, action adventure, and then I was urban fantasy, and then I was supernatural thriller, and then I was horror. And uh, you know, it's funny, but um, I, I've heard the internet described as a universe of niches. And I, I think that that works the best because readers, to some extent, I believe, are defining the categories that they want to read. And I mean, look at the subdivisions of, of fantasy alone. I mean, urban fantasy, steampunk, you know, um, on and on and on. And people are finding these things. And uh, I think that um, publishers' categories exist to help readers find books in a bookstore. But I'm, I'm not sure if online those are as necessary, since instead of being on one shelf, you can have 10 tags that describe your book. So I can be magical realism, urban fantasy, um, supernatural thriller, you know, horror, and, and all of those things will be um, useful for helping a reader interested in that find my book. So, uh, Brandon, do you? I know that you have probably been classified in multiple genres. Um, or do they always put you in the mainstream section? No, they never put me in the mainstream. <laughs> 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 this is me off. Uh, <laughs> huh. They either put me in the literary section, or they put me. Mystery for the most time. Yep. I'd say the breakdown of those two. When I write magic realism or Swiss Dream, um, they put me in the literary section, uh, which nobody reads. So I'd rather be in the mainstream section. Uh, or they stick me in mystery and say things like veteran mystery novelist Randall Silvers. I write other stuff too. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to be categorized like that. But it's, it is a problem. Editors have to categorize you to sell your novel to the sales reps, who are really the decision makers in the publishing house. If an editor loves your work, she takes a meeting with uh, all the sales staff and he pitches your novel and says, you know, it's the next great blah, blah, blah. And if she can't awaken some enthusiasm in the sales staff, who don't, maybe don't know the books too well, but they know what sells. Mm -hmm. If she can't uh, awaken some enthusiasm in, in them, then Sometimes the book doesn't get bought. So it's a marketing tool. A, I've had a, I had a book, my first literary mystery was turned down by my agent because he said it was too well written to be a mystery <laughs> and the plot was too strong for it to be a literary novel. So I marketed it myself and it got me a two book contract from Valentine, sold the screen rights to a, a producer in Hollywood and I talked it, wheedled my way in to, to, to write the screenplay and it was made into a terrible movie. So, <laughs> editors and agents have a job of selling your book, and that's where that's where the genres come from. But as a, as a writer, I pay no attention to what I'm writing at the moment. I just want to tell a good story. Do you think um, editors underestimate readers? Yes, I think they do. Uh, I know I know that I'm the kind of I'm the kind of writer and the kind of reader who likes to be surprised by a book. I don't want to read the same thing book after book, and I refuse to write the same thing book after book, and I think there are a lot of readers like that. But editors seem to think you do the same thing again and again and again, and that's how you build an audience. It may be true, but it's not the, not the modus operandi I follow. Uh, speaking of which, have any of you ever written in under a pen name in a completely different genre? 
Because that uh, happens um, sometimes, too, if you decide that, well, suddenly I have been writing cozy mysteries, but I want to try a really heated romance, then an agent or an editor is like, you know, you probably need to write this under a different name um, because you want people to know that this is a different style. Even if on your website you have both names that are up there, um, I always think of Jenna Bennett um, as Jenny Bentley. She is a New York Times bestselling cozy mystery novel, but then as Jenna Bennett, she writes science fiction romance. And both of her names are right there on her website, but she essentially is two different people, so the people know whenever they pick up a Jenny Bentley book, they're getting the cozy mystery. When they pick up a Jenna Bennett book, they're going to be getting the science fiction romance. Um, and I'm some people were saying that at one point we might get away from that because of all of the actual niches that you have on Amazon, that at this point they just look to see that this author has the, all of these books. So if I like their writing style in one, maybe I'm going to like it in another one. Cerise, were you influenced more by genre fiction or by mainstream fiction or by literary fiction? Um, definitely genre fiction. When I read main, mainstream literary fiction in high school, it bored me and I had to slog through it. And, and I discovered science fiction, Isaac Asimov, um, Kurt Vonnegut, and I, William Gibson, I was just enthralled. And um, so I started to try to write in that, in that style. How about the rest of you, Randall? I, uh, I learned from a literary masters. I, I never took a single writing class. Uh, so I, I have no MFA degree. I'm probably one of the last people in my generation to become a writer without uh, getting an MFA degree. Uh, so I learned from the books I read. I learned from Hemingway and Faulkner and Flannery O'Connor and Gabriel Garcia Marquez and all of the masters. Melissa. Uh, you, uh, I have probably the most eclectic taste. Um, I think a lot of readers maybe do. Um, but uh, yeah, I have an extremely eclectic taste when you're talking Asimov and Vonnegut, I'm like, yep, 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 thinking the list in my head, but then, you know, I can switch complete directions and, you know, go Faulkner and Hemingway and whatever, so as long as I have print in front of me, I'm happy, doesn't matter what it is, and, and really, it's, it's, I don't know that I have a particular style that emulates any one writer, because I feel, I feel a kindred spirit thing going on here with you. I just want to write the stories. That's why that we will, sat him yeah, next to you. That will make sense to the reader and that, that we'll do it. And, and I'm glad to know I'm not the only one that has such a difficult time trying to figure out which box to check to put my book category in. That drives me crazy as well. Um, does, but, your, does your agent hate you as much as mine hates you? Uh, well, uh, yes, myself. I am my own agent. So, yes, we really have a love hate relationship. And Jason? I uh, actually read as much travel writing as I did um, literature. So for me to go, you know, Steinbeck wasn't necessarily just Grapes of Wrath, it was also Travel from Turley and Law from the Sea of Cortez. You know, and I suppose that's where, for me, the realism comes in. I, I like the reality, um, you know, basis as a, a platform for supernatural or for, you know, um, even anthropological types of things, um, a, a lot of uh, books about Yucatec, Mayan archaeology, and I think that for me, you know, if I look at something like Hellbender, which is to some extent magical realism, it's it's the idea that the anthropological religious belief of the people make the magic real. I mean, we're told that uh, unicorns don't exist. Well, in the state of Pennsylvania, we're told that mountain lions are extinct. So if you know somebody witnesses something that supposedly doesn't exist anymore, isn't that a type of magic? And I think that to some extent, um, but ironically, uh, genre, I didn't start reading genre until I was told that I write in that genre. So mm -hmm. I don't really see the lines. I'd like to not see the lines, I'm not gonna avoid it. Wonderful. Well, we, um, for the last little uh, bit of this panel, I would like each of you to tell us where you can find your books, the titles again, and where you can find them. Um, of course, you can find them all right here at the festival as well. They're more than happy to sign you copies of this. Um, but Cerise, we'll start with you. Where else can we find your books? Well, unfortunately, I'm sold out, so you can find my book online. Lucky her, she's sold out. 
My book cog online on Amazon.com. And Randall? On any of the uh, online or brick and mortar bookstores, major bookstores. Yeah. Okay, Melissa. Yeah, same thing. I mean, you find me online, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, your it's print form and the ebook. So, whatever your pleasure is. And Jason. Um, I'm gonna say my titles: uh, The Devil in Preston Black, Hellbender, and the Revelations of Preston Black are available in print from Raw Dog Screaming Press and uh, in print and in e-form at Amazon.com. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining us today, and hopefully the rest of you learned a little bit more about mainstream fiction and maybe found some books that you want to read. All right, thank, thank you. you. And good evening. Welcome back to the Pennsylvania Literary Festival here from the Uniontown Mall in Fayette County, Pennsylvania. We're very happy. To, I just got a nice wave from the crowd there. That was the first time. That was good. Uh, we're very happy to have with us some wonderful authors that are going to be on a panel today talking to us about university writing programs. Um, we're going to start with a little introduction from each of them. So I'm going to start on the far end with Dr. Michael A. Arnson. Hi, I'm Mike Arnson. Uh, I teach at Seton Hill University, where we have a graduate program in writing popular fiction. Uh, we also have an undergraduate creative writing program that offers a unique uh, genre writing certificate, which covers uh, you know, science fiction, fantasy, horror, mystery, western, romance, uh, the whole gamut of, of popular books. I guess that's enough for now. <laughs> and Mary Shapansky. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Marion Schapansky. I'm the author of Playing St. Barbara. It was set in Fayette County, and it's inspired by my family background. And I got my MFA at Warren Wilson. It's a low residency program. And I was not your typical student. Um, I started when I had three kids. I was living overseas, and I was definitely not at my young age. Um, but it, I, I was really pleased that they have something called a low residency program so I could, you know, get better at writing uh, in a sort of a non-traditional environment. And Margo Wilson. Margo, are you also Dr. Margo Wilson? I'm Professor Margo Wilson. <laughs> Professor Margo Wilson. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's so impressive. <laughs> um, I, I am Margo Wilson. I am the chair of the English department at California University of Pennsylvania, and we have an undergraduate writing program in both creative writing and journalism. They're both in the English department. In creative writing, we specialize or generalize in fiction, poetry, and drama, and we do some crea creative nonfiction as well. And in journalism, we do uh, newspaper, magazine, and online writing. And many of our students cross the borders, so um, we offer a concentration in either journalism or creative writing, but everybody's an English major, so there's a lot of cross-channeling going on. And Don Bentley. Hi, I'm Don Bentley. Uh, I write espionage thrillers, and I am a graduate of the Seton Hill MFA program. I had Mike as a professor and somehow still managed to graduate, so if I can, you can too. And you're still talking. And <laughs> Carolyn Carey Gessner. Caroline, actually. Caroline. Um, I should know that because I was your mentor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am a student at, in the Writing Popular Fiction program at Seton Hill University. Um, I'm going into my fourth semester, and I write fantasy. Wonderful. And it's no coincidence that we have so many Seton Hill and California University of Pennsylvania um, authors that are on all these panels because those are the two universities that really came out for the Pennsylvania Literary Festival. So we're very happy about both of that. Actually, they are both my alma mater, so maybe that had something to do with it. <laughs> um, and I'm Heidi Ruby Miller. I graduated from both Cal U whenever I was an undergrad, and I said I was always going to be a writer and then I went into anthropology and geography. <laughs> had nothing whatsoever to do with that. And then I went into foreign languages, and finally when I went to Seton Hill is whenever I started um, into writing. And I um, went through the Writing Popular Fiction graduate program there, 
and now I am a mentor there and I also teach undergraduate classes. So that gives you all the background of all of us. And uh, as far as university programs go, um, we've heard a couple of terms bandied about. One of them was low residency. And um, Marion, would you like to tell us what your low residency program um, was like? It, it was really a great opportunity for people to study writing and not have to give up their day jobs. Um, they didn't have to move to be in a full-time program. Um, the low residency meant that twice a year we would have, we would all gather on campus for about two weeks and it would be so intense. And at that time we would kind of apprentice to a working writer and teacher and over the next six months we would exchange packets of our work every I think for us it was every three weeks. So every three weeks I would send 40 pages of fiction, three essays about the books that I'd read, and a long detailed letter about what I was working on to my mentor, and then they would respond. Um, so it was designed for people, working, you know, working people who wanted to write, but yet didn't have the liberty to just pick up and move somewhere in the country and, and you know, live somewhere else for a while. And Mike, speaking as a former director of the WPF program, would you tell us the similarities um, with uh, Marion's program and how Seton Hill also runs their low residency? Yeah, it's, it's quite similar. All, uh, all Most low residency programs have you know, a, a, a short time period during the year. In our case, I think it's eight days, maybe seven, where all the students come from across the country, across the world, to come back and uh, do writing workshops live and to take classes and to meet with their advisors, which we call mentors, uh, uh, to talk about the thesis projects they're working on. And it, it, it's very similar to, a, to a, a number of these low residency programs that exist right now. Um, but I, I kind of like it. I wish they existed when I was in graduate school because uh, to have a residency at a college is a good thing because you have access to the library, the teachers are at your disposal, sort of. They have office hours anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, you're taking classes maybe two or three a day in, in a PhD program or a master's program. But in the case of a low residency program, you get to leave and just focus on your writing. Uh, and I think it's very easy to be kind of pulled into your coursework, your, your, uh, the distractions of your campus and partying with the other grad students, which people do at our residency as well. <laughs> but but it's just for those seven days. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, seven days of fun. So when people come back from their projects, they're a little lonely and, and eager to reconnect with their friends or the people that they have been uh, swapping stories with that whole, you know, through an online workshop the whole time. So I, I kind of like that returning to the fold and then going back to your office or bedroom or wherever you write and then coming back again. I think that process actually works well with creative writing. Don, is that what drew you to the Seton Hill program? Yeah, that was some of it definitely. I think as a writer I had a sad story because you can't be a writer and not have a sad story, right? And so my sad story was that if I took all the money I had made um, from selling short stories before I came to Seton Hill, I could probably buy one ticket at a movie if it was the discount ticket. And so I was thinking, I was all kidding aside, I felt like I had plateaued and I wasn't sure how to get to where I wanted to be from where I was right there. And I was, my undergrad like really lended itself to writing uh, because I was an electrical engineer and everybody understands that electrical engineers write very, very well, right? <laughs> And so I was in one of my fits of rage where I was thinking about burning every manuscript I had. I went to the library and found an author whose name was Maria V. Snyder. And she was a best-selling, New York Times best-selling author. And I picked her up at random and I flipped over and read her, her book jacket. And I'm like, she's got to be another English major too. And she was a meteorologist. And I'm like, she's a weather girl. And she's a New York <laughs> Times bestseller. And so I wrote her, and she was kind enough to write back to me, and she's like, it was this program. It was this program that did it for me. Come to Seton Hill, and I did. Well, I had no idea that was because of Maria. That is wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, Carrie, how about you? 
why did you decide to go? Because you are local with Don, I can mm. see, because he isn't local, but with you, you, uh, Pittsburgh has quite a few, uh, the Pittsburgh region has lots of writing opportunities. Right. Um, I, by the time I decided to apply to Seton Hill, I had been back from the Peace Corps for about three or four months, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and I was attracted to the, the Seton Hill program because it was low residency, and I could work while I was going to school, so I wasn't, you know, piling up the debt. <laughs> um, um, and it was a benefit that it was so close for me, even though, you know, it would only be a week out of the year that I'd be gone. Um, and then you ended up becoming people. involved in all of these other activities. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Morgan, speaking um, to this from the undergraduate side, um, when your students ask you, um, well, first of all, are most of your students English majors, or do you also get the mixed group um, where they are a biology major that has to take the English credit? Um, we, ha we have a mix. We, most of our students are English majors specializing in either creative writing or journalism and a few literature people coming over. But um, we have a number of students. For example, I remember that we had a computer science student who just loved poetry. So he took every class that he possibly could take just because that was his love. So that's a possibility as well. For our creative writing classes, they don't transfer over into the general education classes, so they can't just take them and get some genetic, well, they can get credit, but it doesn't really help them along. So it's either people who really want to take creative writing classes but are in some other major or our own majors. Come through. And then, um, does California have a graduate program no. in writing? No. Okay. No. I wondered about that. Um, the Seton Hill certificate that you were talking about, Mike, that you can get that as an undergrad or um, you can get that just as the certificate itself? Like, do you have to enroll as an undergrad? You do have to be an undergraduate for that. Uh, you can get a certificate in, in writing popular fiction from Seton Hill if you're not enrolled in the master's program. Uh, but it costs just as much as the MFA, <laughs> so <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people opt not to do that. Uh, yeah, but our genre writing certificate for undergrads is really part of the English major, and it's an alternative way of mi essentially minoring in creative writing at Seton Hill. Or if you're already a creative writing major, you can minor in genre writing, essentially, by doing the certificate. And it's kind of an excuse for, for the students who really love uh, and are passionate about genres in particular to have to, at least one class where they can step away from everything focus on reading a lot of novels in that genre because, you know, they're usually busy reading other things, literary novels or something. You don't have time uh, to read Twilight or whatever it is they, want, <laughs> they might want to read. So this gives them a way to do that, earn college credit for it by actually reading them critically and doing a lot of creative writing uh, in those class workshops. And um, it's a relatively new certificate program, but the enrollments are going up and up every year. Uh, because people are becoming very attracted to this idea that while they're doing their studies, they can have this um, thread throughout their college career where they're working on a novel or you know reading a lot of books that they just love to read. And part of it too, I'll just end this by saying, during NaNoWriMo, which is National Novel Writing Month, every November, uh, we host write-ins on campus and those students get really active then participating in that. And, in, and some students have found out about the certificate by doing that. Ah. So that's a really fun time on campus in November when everybody's working on a book. Yeah, I've participated in that sometimes, and that creative energy is just like you can feel it. Yeah. Uh, this is a question for any of you. If we had um, students who are high school students in the audience, what advice would you give them when they're looking to find a university if they if they want to be a writer? Mm, that's a good one. I would advise them to look for a program that had on the faculty a writer whose work they particularly admire. Um, because generally when you start to write, you're reading a lot. That's really the basic 
way to start. And then so you will find a writer or writers whose style or subject matter or something really resonates with you. And that's, I think that's the best advice, is study with the person whose work you admire and would like to write like. Um, that's is how that I how, how you came to your program? Actually, <laughs> I came to my program when, when I was looking for, I, I didn't even have any intention of going to graduate school. I was at Breadloaf kind of by accident. We had just moved overseas. My husband was transferred. I had three little kids, and I, there was like a little meeting if you wanted to know more about an MFA. I didn't even know what an MFA was at the time. I had taken two community college creative writing classes. I was a journalist by, by you know, training. And the first thing they said was, you don't have to take the GRE for our program. And I thought, okay, I'm in. <laughs> and you know, the low residency idea, there were only three at the time. So I called my husband that night from the airport hotel and said, I'm going to graduate school. And he said, yeah, right. Um, and it was the most impulsive thing I ever did, but I made it work. So I really didn't even know the faculty members. So I'm giving out advice that I didn't take at the time, but I was too stupid and naive and knew with the whole deal to know that. But in retrospect, I was very lucky. I got to work with, my thesis supervisor was Richard Russo, who won the Pulitzer Prize for Empire Falls. And I love his work. I want to write like Rick. And so I did end up in the right place after all. Um. What, what happens whenever uh, people are coming down to Cal? What do you tell prospective students about your program to get them interested? Um, I tell them that the faculty are working writers, and I think that's important that we know what we're talking about because we do it. And also, we're a small enough program that we know all our students and we try to nurture them along, and um, we're a fun group, and we're small enough that all the students know each other, and it just becomes a community. And I think that's really important that you don't have a huge writing program where it's just very impersonal, but where the faculty can focus on each individual student and help them attain their goals. And I, too, am a graduate of a low residency program. <laughs> I was going to ask you, like, next for yeah. you guys that actually matriculated. Actually, we yeah, went we to the went same program, oh, except it moved and changed yeah. its name. Yeah, yeah. But um, that's another thing, is look at what's right for you. Like, Cal, I think, is a really, and Seton Hill, are both really good opportunities in the area. And so if you want to stay in the area, they're both great places to go. Um, if you can't make the investment of taking the time to go on campus and do the traditional student thing, um, a low residency program is an excellent opportunity. I think I went to Goddard College and um, it was probably the best educational experience I had in my life because I was working one-on-one -on -one with a professor. And it was the first time anybody had really paid attention to my work. And so I try to carry that over to Cal, but it becomes a little bit more difficult because it's an institution and it's larger, but we try to keep it small enough that we, we maintain some of that personal touch. So that's what I tell them. And Mike, where have you matriculated from? Where have I matriculated from? Yes. Trying not to answer that in a horror writer way. Uh, <laughs> uh, I actually, <clears throat> I went to undergraduate school at Pueblo, Colorado, University of Southern Colorado, and it was great, but I didn't realize that I would do writing. I uh, didn't choose a major right away. I just took a bunch of classes, and I was enjoying the English classes the most. I was really getting into it. I had already started writing on my own, imitating the writers that I admire. Uh, and I wonder if that's me. That's okay. Zach's fiddling with his, the, the instruments. It's okay. <laughs> I just want to go like this next time. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so I, I think there's something to be said for just writing on your own, you know, doing your own program. If you're in high school right now and you're thinking about attending college to be a writer, uh, do it only because you really love it and that's all you want to do. You really want to devote your time to it. But you better hope you have some stories to tell, something to write about, some knowledge 
uh, to, to share, I think, uh, at least some life experience that you can draw from. And sometimes, uh, you know, majoring in, in something uh, like archaeology or something like that can, can help give you a foundation to, of, of discovery. You know, to me, writing's all about discovery. So if you like to read books and go to the library and look up things, what do you like to look up? That should be your major. You know? And people don't go to the library to look up writing <laughs> often until they've started writing and get really like, I want to market myself. Then, then they start doing it. So if you're at that point, then start looking into an MFA program. Uh, that would be my advice. Uh, uh, Carrie and Don, had you started writing before you came to Seton Hill? Yeah, absolutely. That, that wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't being too facetious about my last answer. I had, and uh, I had taken, once I started getting serious about writing and realized it was something I wanted to pursue, I had taken some classes like Writer's Digest, they used to offer, maybe they still do, some really good introductory basic writing classes that were online. But I knew that, so people have talked a lot of times about community of writers and that I knew on my own I was probably about as good as I could get, and it wasn't good enough yet. And I think that is, there's some people like what Mike was saying that knew they wanted to be writers from the beginning. I think there's some people that come to that realization and then say, if I really want to do this, I've got to go to a place that challenges me where the people are better than I am and I can learn from that. And that's kind of where I was. Very well said, very well said. You don't um, want to follow that up deeper. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been writing, I mean, really bad poems stories since high school um, and I majored in English in undergrad but I was too scared to do creative writing um, and then uh, so I went to the into the Peace Corps and when I came back I decided I have to do something I really love to do and I need to be happy and that ended up being writing that's why but it's interesting I know this that your time in the Peace Corps and this is what Mike was talking about earlier you, it reflects in your thesis novel that That's, you're writing yeah. right now. Is there a question? Tell us about your thesis novel. <laughs> yes, explain to us how your Peace Corps experience is working in okay. your thesis novel. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when, okay, well, I was in Kazakhstan. I taught English to fifth graders through 11th graders. Um, and it's, I learned Russian. Uh, they do speak Kazakh over there too which I learned a little bit of, but I, while I, when I came back, I became very interested in, um, like, de not dealing with other cultures, but um, kind of trying to incorporate them and understanding them. So my thesis is fantasy, but it deals with a few different cultures and how they understand one another or don't understand one another. Um, and I don't know. I'm just really interested in multiculturalism. English undergrad? Mm -hmm. did you do? Yes. No, I was a journalism undergrad. You're a journalism undergrad? Oh, so no wonder you married yeah. both journalism yeah. undergrads. Wow. I, I, like worked as, yeah. <laughs> I worked as a journalist for 20 years, and then um, I went to school in various things at various times while I was a journalist and kept quitting and then going back. But at one point, I decided that my thing had always been writing and I needed to get better. And so that's when I did the low residency program. And I was an editor at that time. So I would edit during the day and write by night. So yeah. That's, that's a theme that we hear often. Um, and in closing, because we're starting to run out of time, I'm going to echo what Don said about community, because that's the one thing that every single person up here agrees on, is that that's what you get whenever you go to a university program. Um, if you're someone who's not sure if going to the university is right for you. There are also other ways to gain community through other writing organizations. Um, and if you find that spot that helps you, that gets you to where you need to go, then just like Marion said, you, you'll know it. You, you just feel it immediately. And I, I think that's probably what you've gotten from all of these people up here is that they feel um, very heartfelt about the places where they teach and um, where they went to school. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and thank you all of our wonderful authors and teachers and students.